Hey, everybody, welcome to this Listen First conversation. I am Pierce Godwin, founder and CEO of Listen First Project and leader of the Listen First movement. Listen First Project hey, facilitates welcome greater welcome understanding, respect, respect, and cooperation by encouraging the timeless but abandoned practice of listening to each other, especially those with whom we disagree. Um, we believe that the Listen First movement can restore relationships, build bridges, and mend the frayed fabric of society. As each one of us individually pledges to listen first, we will restore civil discourse in America one Listen First conversation at a time. So let's have one right now. Since Obamacare became a word in 2009, Healthcare has been a hot topic for citizens and policymakers. The political parties have been at war on this issue now for eight years, with many elections won and lost over health care. A lot of us have opinions and talking points, but how much do we really know about such a complex issue? Listen First Project, in partnership with Living Room Conversations, is producing this live Listen First conversation to explore the health care issue with doctors, patients, and taxpayers. We've asked these folks to follow several Listen First conversation guidelines, including come curious with an open mind, ready to learn and grow. Fully listen to and consider another's views before sharing your own. Listen as you want to be listened to. Be fully present rather than thinking of how to respond. Show respect and suspend judgment. Look for common ground and appreciate differences. Be authentic and welcome that from others. And finally, own and guide the conversation. This conversation is for all of us and for you guys in the audience to enjoy and learn from as well. So let's get it started. Uh, first, by getting to know each other a little bit. Um, we're gonna go around and have everybody share their name, a little bit of your background, and how you first became interested in healthcare. And Ben, why don't you kick it off for us? Uh, thanks, Pierce. Uh, appreciate the invitation to be involved tonight. Uh, this is awesome, awesome project. Uh, so I'm, uh, my name's Ben Wood. I'm a plastic surgeon in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, currently in the uh, MBA program with Pierce. That's how we got connected um, at UNC. But uh, I did my training in North Carolina uh, at Wake Forest University. Went up to Washington, D.C. Sorry about that. Washington, D.C. for three years uh, to finish training at the Children's Hospital and stayed in practice there for a couple of years before coming back here to North Carolina and joining practice in Raleigh last summer. So it's a little bit of my, my background. Um, I have a kind of a, a mixed practice now between uh, insurance based uh, reconstructive surgery and uh, uh, self pay cosmetic surgery. Uh, so I, I've been fortunate to see kind of the broad spectrum of uh, both adult and pediatric patients and uh, insurance uh, and, uh, self-pay. So, uh, kind of, kind of a broad spectrum. What initially got me in, interested in, uh, medicine in general, um, is just kind of a, a drive from an uh, early age to, to be a doctor. So, uh, I don't know, I don't know what really, uh, generated that. Uh, my uncle was a physician, but, uh, he was the only one in the family. I just always kind of felt a kind of a calling or, or, or a draw to, to medicine, uh, and stuck with that over the years and, um, had an early draw to plastic surgery for those reasons that you have a lot of opportunities to go different directions and have exposure to a broad, diverse group of patients. And, um, so that's, that's what uh, fascinated me from, from the beginning with that field. And that's, that's uh, what I'm still doing now. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Laura, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm Laura. I, uh, live in, in Oakland, California. Um, and, uh, I was introduced to the list first uh, format uh, through my, my good friend, Sabrina Boyle. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just a regular citizen, I guess. Um, but I am deeply invested in, in the healthcare conversation. Um, in part, I, you know, I've uh, been struggling with a chronic illness for the past couple of years. So I um, have you know, before Obamacare, you know, had the experience of being uninsurable because I was pregnant, which at the time was a, you know, a, a pre-existing condition that disqualified me from any kind of affordable plan. So um, I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
and uh, yeah, so I, I, I have very, you know, on a very personal level been impacted by all of the changes in the past, um, you know, several, several years since, since um, the Affordable Care Act, you know, since before the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. was passed. So um, it definitely affects me. Yeah. And, okay, and so many much. people I love very, very personally. Yeah, we look forward to hearing more of that personal experience. Thank you, Laura. Trey. All right. Uh, so my name is Trey. Um, I am a sports medicine fellow. Um, currently, I am in uh, New Jersey. And um, a little bit of my background. Um, so I uh, started at Wake Forest for both um, undergrad um, as well as medical school. Um, and then um, after medical school, I came up to uh, Philadelphia and um, did my residency in PM&R which is physical medicine and rehabilitation. I did that at Temple University, and uh, now I'm doing a one-year fellowship. And so a little, a little bit about the uh, um, background um, in terms of um, um, interest in, in healthcare um, originally. Um, so I went into medicine um, just from a various different reasons that kind of came together. I had a little bit of exposure through Boy Scouts, um, but then also um, I had exposure uh, because my um, grandfather um, was a medic in World War II. And so knowing that, uh, his background and talking about that with, with him when I was young, mm. I got interested in medicine. Um, and uh, really, I'm the uh, first physician in my family. He was a medic, but I'm the first physician. Um, so um, and, uh, my whole family is interested in medicine. I do have multiple family members that are um, related to the medical field, but no other physicians. Awesome. Thanks, Trey. John, thank you for being with us. No, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I guess uh, my name is John Dorsey. I'm a psychiatrist. I practice down here in Greensboro, Alabama, which is mm. a small town about 45 minutes south of Tuscaloosa. Uh, I'm originally from Ohio, but I grew up in California. Um, come from a family of physicians. Uh, I can't say that I think that that probably influenced me, but it's hard to say exactly what, what it was that drew me to medicine i think it's sort of an ongoing process of sort of discovering and sort of realizing beautiful parts and sort of the uh that calling inside myself has been i think a process mm -hmm. through my training um i also run a nonprofit organization down here that focuses on housing um transportation and support services for adults and also after school programs for kids and does an educational component students are interested in medicine or service careers and sort of community-based service careers. Um, I guess that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you. And finally, Stephen, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. I'm happy to be here. I live in Oakland, California. I've uh, had a career in special education and uh, health and education and welfare were very entangled in all the work I did with uh, young adults. And I've uh, uh, seen lots of situations where people didn't have good health because health care wasn't there for them. And um, it's been very uh, trying situation before Obamacare for uh, many years. Um, and uh, and then it got, I mean, many, I mean, over the years, it was better some years ago, then it got a lot worse. And now it's, now we'll see what's going to happen. But I'm, uh, my wife's a physician and doing a lot of uh, frontier work in uh, uh, neuro, neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity and stuff. And so I'm keenly interested in the subject and I hope uh, we can um, uh, explore our views. That's what, I'm, that's what it's about. Yeah, no doubt about it. Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody getting us started by sharing. Going to get a little more free flowing from now. Just hop in whenever you have something to say. Listening first, of course. Um, but somebody jump in on how you would describe your philosophy towards healthcare. Uh, and let's just have a more natural conversation uh, as we get underway on the topic. Who's got a philosophy on healthcare they'd like to share? Okay. As it is in most of the Western world, healthcare is, is a given. <laughs> Uh, society takes care of its people, and healthcare is uh, is a human right to be cared for. Uh, at base, at least, that you know, a very uh, fundamental level. 
uh, sure you could add on to that and get extra special services. That's something else. But just to, if you have a need, it can be taken care of. I believe society should do that for each other. Thanks, Stephen. So, so Stephen, I appreciate you kicking that off and going straight to one of the fundamental issues, right? Is is healthcare a right or is it a privilege? And uh, we've been accused of these conversations being a bit too staid. So um, I'm going to go ahead and look for some disagreement. Does anybody want to jump in saying that they that they see healthcare as more of a privilege as opposed to a right? And if not, that's fine. You go ahead and share your perspective. <laughs> Stephen's ready. He's laughing. He's ready to take it on. Uh, I, I, I don't, it'd be hard for someone to say that healthcare is a privilege. It's like breathing as a privilege. All right. All right. Nobody's taking that bait. Who wants to share your philosophy? Well, so I, I think it, it uh, comes down to how you define it. I think it's certainly a right. Um, but, you know, healthcare in and of itself, is, is a lot more complex than a, a black and white issue, you know, either uh, right or, or privilege, I think. So there, it's, it's, there's certainly a right to have access to it, but there's lots of different levels and there's, and there's lots of different complexities to it. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's, that's what's caused a lot of the, the controversy and the policy development over the last decade and probably from that. So, um, I think that's that's why it's, it's hard to it's a, it's very difficult to say it's not right, but um, it, in terms of what you know an individual's personal responsibility is towards having uh, access to certain levels of, of health care uh, is probably like where the complexity comes into play. Yeah, Ben, I think that's an awesome framing. Anything you would share of your own perspective on where in that gray space? And first of all, Ben makes a point that I think can be made on any of these issues. We love to think they're black and white and we love to use our talking points. And when are they ever that simple? So I appreciate you bringing that up, Ben. But it, from your own experience and perspective, any any point on that spectrum you would point towards? So I, I, um, I'll just jump right into it with, a, with, uh, with the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think. And I got a little, just uh, full disclosure, a lot of this is uh, secondhand information from my mentor in Washington, D.C., who spent a, a whole semester in graduate school uh, reading the Affordable Care Act, paid, you know, every page. So uh, he was a very reliable resource, and I gleaned a lot of you know, conversations with him. Um, but, and then this can certainly be debated, but the way it was kind of structured and has been structured is that everyone is given a a certain tier of health care, whether or not they need it or, or even desire it. Um, and it ends up not being sustainable at that level. So I guess the, ana the analogy that he used is that it, it would be like giving everyone, you know, a, a Lexus to drive when maybe there are people who don't prefer driving a Lexus or who don't need to drive a Lexus. Um, and so that's, and you quickly run out of the ability to, to sustain that for the whole population. Um, so, that, that's the closest analogy that I've heard. It's not perfect, but uh, I, do, I, do, I think that everyone has individual needs um, and, and a lot of that can be unexpected when it comes to healthcare. So you, you don't know how this is difficult to plan, but uh, I think if, if you plan responsibly, then, uh, then you can be in a position to, you certainly have access to all the healthcare that you, that you would need and be in a position to, to receive that. Uh, there's, a lot of complexities beyond that, you know, with regard to relationships with pharmaceutical companies and device companies and insurance companies uh, that all uh, sway how that works uh, in Washington uh, with with their, their lobbying. So uh, it's a difficult Thank issue. You. Yeah, yeah, very difficult. But we're going to solve it in the next hour, right, y'all? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> who else wants to share kind of your philosophy on on healthcare or respond to anything that Stephen or Ben have said to this point? All right, John, I'm calling I on guess, you. <laughs> uh, did you call on me? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, John. I mean, it's it's hard because I mean, even the term healthcare is complex idea um i mean i don't think that there's many people who would who would just can you guys see me it, yeah i don't think there's many people who would disagree 
that you can't let, you can't uh, just say anybody out on their own, um, but also there's sort of a finite number of resources. I think one of the things that a lot of people come to healthcare with is sort of this assumption that healthcare is taken through their experience either as a physician or through their patient not acknowledge the complexity of patients, the complexity of all these different systems that is provided in the, the area that I focus on is sort of in health. And I sort of think about patients along the spectrum. There's people who have sort of stable relationships, stable housing, um, stable finances, and they aren't really typically the big drivers of healthcare sort of consumption. Um, they, people probably, like the participants, and I, I don't want to say anything, but whose, whose lives are pretty well together otherwise and typically present to physicians with a discrete issue and sort of it can be either addressed or not. And then at the other end of the spectrum is sort of the area like where you're looking at community mental health, people with schizophrenia, who have drug and alcohol problems, whose lives are in chaos and turmoil, and their needs from the healthcare system are something different than my needs from the healthcare system. And so right. that's where I think a lot of the complexity gets, for example, providing have high specialty care for the patients that I'm taking care of when their more basic needs of housing, transportation, and other things are for things that would be the, give the greatest bang for their body. There's that, that's where I think some of the complexity lies. Yeah, great point. Trey or Laura, anything you want to share about your philosophy as we kick it off? Um, just in response to whether it's a right or a privilege, um, my, re my first reaction when you said that was like, I kind of felt both because um, in, in kind of what Ben was talking about where there are um, different levels. So I think that um, everybody to some degree um, should be able to receive health care. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that, um, that, that the, to do everything for everybody is just something that is not necessarily feasible from the um, economic standpoint. Um, so and I think that you have to try and uh, walk that balance between providing the best care um, available and at the same time, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do um, that are cost effective. So I think a lot of things we need to focus on are those cost effective things to try and, um, try and prevent illness um, and then kind of take it from there. Yeah. What, what things are coming to mind for you, Trey? I mean, a lot of you guys on this in this conversation have some direct experience. So share what what the good things that the rest of us should should recognize is very cost effective um, in the system. Um, so I, mean, I think preventative medicine is um, huge. I mean, that's, that's kind of a broad category, but um, but I mean, when when you're thinking about uh, primary care, um, it's so much easier to um, to prevent um, so many of them that just I mean, it's a, I know it's a generality, but um, but whether it's like um, stroke, for example. If you are able to prevent a stroke, then uh, not only does that um, result in better um, um, function and, and better life for the patient, but it also um, it also limits the healthcare costs because mm -hmm. um, of everything involved um, down the line. Like you hear about a patient having a stroke, you don't necessarily automatically think about the um, the hospital bill, the um, everything that went into trying to um, limit the limit the effect of the stroke in the acute care setting. Um, and then all the rehabilitation, um, and then on top of all that, you have the uh, the cost of society, where you have somebody that is a productive member of society who now has to be cared for, and you flip that um, individuals from from um, being able to um, be fully functional to then having to have um, access to health care. So, I mean, there's just so many examples, whether it's in yeah. pediatric, um, whether it's um, everything from um, immunizations to um, and that's another whole topic, but, um, but everything that um, from having routine checkups with your physician, um, all these things can catch problems before they're an issue. Great point. Laura, any starting thoughts on the healthcare topic? Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I might just go a, a step further and please go ahead. A, a, a more controversial thing to say, but. Good. Let's go. I, I mean, I don't, I don't believe that um, healthcare should be uh, profit-driven. Um, mm. You know, governed by by market forces. Um, 
I mean, I find it, I find it very troubling that um, as a nation, we spend more per capita um, on healthcare, you know, relative to other industrialized nations, and yet have some of the worst, you know, <laughs> health out health outcomes in the industrialized world. And um, you know, I guess I don't, I don't really see why, you know, CEOs of, of insurance companies should be, you know, padding their pockets um, with you know, high cost insurance, insur you know, insurance premiums. Um, and when I say that, it's not to say that I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I do feel that, that, you know, physicians, uh, uh, specialists, you know, um, I'm not trying to say that I don't think doctors should be, you know, should be able to, to make, to make a lot of money because, you know, I, I know, um, how extensive the training is, um, and uh, how expensive it is, and you know, I it's this. This is not to say also that I don't think you know doctors should be able to to provide discretionary health services um, to those that can afford them. But in, in general, um, you know, I, I I just don't I just don't think that uh, that. Medicine is about the generation of, or that it should be about the generation of profit. So, Laura, I think that's a good point. Um, uh, I, you know, it's it's unbelievable to know, to know that you know the country spends you know, on healthcare in the trillions of dollars every year, so three to four trillion dollars, you know, over ten thousand dollars a head. And then if you look at that charted out against the other country, developed countries of the world, it's just we're just so far separated from any other developed country it's it's ridiculous and that and outcomes are hard, really hard to assess but you know you can't look at things like life expectancy and and we're not we're, we're, we're still behind on that even to countries that spend far less on healthcare. so you know i i think um i, I agree with you i mean i i think that um it shouldn't be a, a profit driven industry um but i do appreciate you defending the doctors <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I see that fairness that, I mean, you were saying that, that, you know, you're a plastic surgeon and you work with insurance companies, um, to perform, you know, reconstructive, um, surgery for patients who, you know, for whom that, that is really, a you know, a necessary, a totally necessary service, but I, you know, certainly wouldn't, um, you know, I don't feel that people who seek, uh, you know, cosmetic surgery, I mean, they should be able to pay out of pocket for for those services as well, and you and you deserve to 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 you know be paid what you know what your services are worth. So no no question about that. Right. I I think a lot of the problem is is things. So I, I, and when I see the the healthcare spend in the trillions, I, I see it in kind of like two silos. I see that there's definitely a patient side that you alluded to, or um, that that Trey alluded to, in terms of preventable you know, preventive health care, preventable diseases. Mm -hmm. I think there, there's a lot of responsibility for everyone to, to take care of themselves and, and, and monitor their health and eat well and exercise and, and that kind of thing to prevent these diseases. And the, I mean, the, the most expensive conditions driving those trillions every year are preventable things like diabetes and, and heart disease. And, and so, you know, we can do our own part in our own lives to, to reduce that, which are in itself reduce the, the health care expense. Um, but then there's a whole other side with the regular, you know, regulatory, uh, governmental agencies and, and industries, and, all, and the lobby there. And so, you know, it's it's no secret that United Healthcare stock went, went up 40 percent last year. You know, that's there, there's, I mean, it's, those are very profit-driven industries, and it's kind of become a, a game where everyone has to out, outpace each other. Hospitals, uh, you know, charge hundreds of percent. Uh, on super bills, uh, knowing that they're only going to collect a smaller percentage, and that drives pharmaceutical companies to do the same to drive their research and development, and then in other device industries, and and the insurance companies. So it's it's become a, a game that's kind of spiraling out of control in that direction. Um, so I, I just kind of look at it in those two silos, and 
So that both of those things need to need to be focused on in different ways to help reduce the cost and and probably also uh, uh, um, overall improve outcomes. But I think the, the real way to improve outcomes is leveraging technology. That's this is kind of another tangent, but um, one one of the things I've noticed in the last ten or twelve years that I've been you know on the ground day to day in, in medicine is that uh, we're we're still functioning. If you walk into a hospital on a level of probably 15 or 20 years ago in terms of technology. We're just, we're way behind thinking about what we're capable of from our phones. Uh, we need to really start leveraging that to improve communication between doctors and uh, so, that, so that repetitive uh, expenses are, are minimized you know, and drive down costs that way too. So there's tons of opportunities. I guess it's the summary of all, of all that. But, um, each, each one deserves a concerted effort. Then what's an innovation that seems eminently doable that uh, that you wish we could make happen in, in that technological sense? I, I think um, having uh, your own chart, your own medical records uh, on your person as part of your person uh, that can be transferred anywhere would just revolutionize healthcare in the industry. I mean, I think that's what we're missing, you know. So uh, if you go to if you go to an an emergency room and have treatment, they should be able to know within seconds your medical history, what medications you take, what your, you know, eventually when wearable technology further develops, you know, know your recent vital signs and, uh, but not have to start from scratch with that for you. Um, and then once you, once you are treated for that acute condition and follow up with your regular physician, all that information should, should be instantaneously provided to that physician. And so you don't, that would, that would save a lot of time. That's that's one of the major crunches in healthcare, right? Is, is having time with, with providers of a different, any different level, um, but then also not repeating expensive tests and, and imaging and things like that, and and not trying, not making medication changes. Uh, my own family, I, I experienced this from a personal level. With my grandfather had that same situation recently, the heart condition. His medications were changed. He saw his regular physician who didn't know why they were changed. So there's a lot of opportunity there for communication to help help just improve efficiency uh, which would dr dramatically reduce the healthcare expenditure across the board so we're capable of all that now we I mean look at how we're communicating right now on this call i mean this okay. this doesn't okay. take place in, a, in, in an analogous form in healthcare mm -hmm. great point. are we stuck in this system does it have to be with insurance companies taking 25, 30% of the funds that go into the process. Why not Medicare for everyone or universal health care or single payer? These are terms that have been used a lot for just uh, having a much less expensive way of doing it, very similar to many other industrialized countries. We're the only one that does it this way. And that's really an international shame. Couldn't, what would it, I mean, in, in California, there's, there's, a, there's been, and there will be a single payer of bill, uh, bill going through, and maybe, maybe we'll be able to get that here. As long as one state starts it in Canada, it was Saskatchewan, uh, who, where um, single payer was begun, and then it spread through the country. The expenses we've, indicated are so high they don't have to be and so much of the money is all on profit and there we don't have profit in the police department and the, the defense department and the fire department saving a person whose house is burning saving a person who's having a heart attack why should there be one going through this big profit grabbing industry i don't know but it was we seem stuck in that because it's there's so many uh, powerful people making so much money unless we vote it out. That could happen. Yeah. Well, I'll go back to Laura's point. I, I, I uh, of all the lobbies in Washington steering that that conversation, the the physician, the provider level lobby is probably the weakest. It's certainly the weakest. And so, um, you know, that's that's. If, if anybody's read uh, America's Bitter Pill, 
Um, that book, I think, does a good job uh, giving an overview of how of how the Affordable Care Act um, came to be in its current state and, and what its original intent was and uh, all of the forces that were acting on molding it into what it ended up being. Um, I, it's, it seems almost insurmountable, but, I, but it certainly got a, it's got to change directions because it's not sustainable. That's, that's one thing that I think even Pearson, your sort of framing of things, you said, what's the role of government? What's the role of the marketplace? What's the role of patients? The one sort of entity is the providers was in, sort of included in that. And I'm not saying that there needs to be some balance. So obviously, all of those sort of are going to have some role. But it does seem like the physicians and other providers voices are not being sort of at the table nearly as strongly as they should because they're in some ways the ones who can arbitrate what's going on in the ground and what between what should be going on at the policy level but i think that there has been sort of this effort to sort of marginalize or to push aside sort of the well, providers as well, a as a force towards improving the system i i I agree. What as a provide as providers, you guys, what is the force that's where is the uh, force that's pushing you aside and saying, no, you, your voice doesn't count. Our voice counts. Where is that coming from? You know, I mean, I think it really is the responsibility of physicians and I think responsibility of nurses, other people who are providers to on the ground. I mean, I think that we're going through an enormous period of experimentation. I don't know that anybody knows how this all should turn out. But I think that there are, there is a role for providers to experiment and try to develop and try to develop solutions or try to develop better or improvements to existing system. And I think not only encouraging that, but supporting that is, a, I think, a, a realistic path forward to providing better. So, I mean, I think most people would acknowledge that we've got a system that has many, many problems. And the question is, how do we sort of guide it in a more functional direction? And I would just say that each one of those entities has to play a role, but I would say that the providers on the ground really have to take take some of that responsibility and being supported in, in taking some of that responsibility. Can I just add that the, um, the physicians um, in this group, I mean, do you feel that the, the current system, you know, uh, given that it is, is prop, profit driven I mean do you feel like as practitioners that you're kind of incentivized in the wrong ways by that s system like a, you know away from you know providing more efficient and effective care um, towards providing more expensive care because it I don't know benefits uh, uh, I, I'm just I'm, I'm this is an open question I'm just I'm, I'm asking um, like, do you do you feel those those uh, force those same forces working on you in terms of of how it guides the care that you? Uh, I I would I would say that the, the forces that you feel on a daily basis, if, if there's anything that's driving up healthcare costs from a from a physician perspective uh, over the past ten years, it's probably been medical legal. So over ordering of tests and imaging uh to really prove your case that you know that you exhaustively evaluated the patient and, and to cover all the bases medically mm -hmm. legally um that's probably if if you could pinpoint a reason that physicians could be held responsible for driving up healthcare costs that's probably it and that's probably just a force that you kind of feel on a daily basis um i will say that it's there's no there's no arguing that physician compensation is not driving up the healthcare costs every year it gets ratcheted down in terms of re reimbursement levels from insurance providers, so um, the force that you feel there is is trying to uh, code and bill uh, to to the best to you know ethical ethically, but uh, to the best extent possible um, to make sure that you can at least stay on level ground um, because every year they come back with lower reimbursements for providing the same services. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the that's the pressure in that regard, but I don't think there's a there's no there's definitely no way to to really game the system there. They're, they're, that's very well regulated and monitored. So, um, but it's just a constant it's a constant kind of battle that you feel. Uh, my my you know uh, my regular um, exposure to to this has kind of evolved since the Affordable Care Act was 
uh, the, the increase in deductibles that patients are responsible for. And so I feel badly, you know, that uh, if a patient comes to me uh, after skin cancer removal and needs a reconstruction, that's, that's not an elective procedure that needs to be done. Um, and I, my hands are tied with what that patient's responsibility is for that procedure. There's a certain procedure that needs, needs to be done. Their deductible is a certain amount that's already been agreed upon. And, and my hands are tied really in, in what, what I can do in, in, in terms of the financials for that for them. So that's, uh, and that's only, that's gone in a less favorable way for both the patient and for the provider, unfortunately. So everyone feels badly about it, except the insurance companies. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, it, that's for me is part of the irony is that that um, you know, in fact, uh, my since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, my out-of-pocket medical costs have risen exponentially in terms of as a percentage of, of income. Um, to to the extent that I've you know been able to get health insurance through my employer. Um, my my out of pockets my out of pocket healthcare costs have exploded. Um, so in some ways, I'm you know I'm like among the many kind of like middle middle class people who you know could potentially sort of feel shafted um, by you know how this is like because basically like the the kind of healthcare that I had but you know through my employer before the passage of the affordable Act was it would be considered a, a Cadillac plan um, now and uh, hence would be taxed at a much higher rate for my employer so so basically you know like so many other middle class Americans um, who get insured through their employer I've been pushed on to a high deductible plan because that that becomes kind of the only option um, because the so-called Cadillac plans are, are essentially unaffordable now um, and, you know, I would feel bitter about that <laughs> if it weren't for the fact that, um, I mean, I feel bitter, but it's, it's sort of for other reasons, <laughs> but I, I, I would feel more bitter about that if I, if I hadn't seen, you know, at the same time, like, for instance, I have a, a good friend who, um, uh, has a, a congenital heart condition and was basically, you know, uninsurable before the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, she also works in the food industry, so she does not have access to, I mean, she's never really had access to uh, employer provided coverage. Um, and so, so she went for many years without being able to address her congenital heart condition. <laughs> you know, now uh, pays affordable, highly subsidized premiums, you know, for her, for her, for her health, uh, her health care policy. So, um, you know, I do feel on some level, like if, if I have to pay more in, in, in health care costs so that my friend can have health care, like that's, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm willing to do. But, but I think that um, there is a way in which things feel, you know, unsustainable even at this point just because still uh, you know as a as a as a percentage of income i think everybody's everybody's healthcare costs are really have, re have really gone up in the past few years it's 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 a huge you know chunk of of my monthly nut my, my healthcare expenses yeah. laura i so appreciate you bringing in your own personal experience and that of your friend any other experiences that you all have had that are kind of top of mind whenever this this topic comes up well it, i i agree with laura expenses have gone up yeah, significantly uh with uh pro, you know what do you call it pro, prior condition uh, situation uh, uh my wife had a prior issue and and uh, only until she got to be old enough to be on medicare was that uh, no longer a problem. We were paying, we were paying, uh, God, I don't know, but 40, 30, 30 ish percent of, of, of our, of our annual income uh, for uh, healthcare. And now with, with Medicare, it's, it's less, but with, you know, um, my, my daughter has 
a lot of different issues and she's still living at home it, it, uh, uh, but it's still very um you know pretty pricey you know the expenses of it are and uh we do we're doing the best we can but it's pretty high so I mean, uh I had a good friend uh, who, uh, during medical school, this is this is pre Affordable Care Act, um, so maybe about ten years ago. During medical school, he was diagnosed with lymphoma, and uh, had health insurance through the, the medical school, uh, but his his coverage uh, didn't didn't allow for treatment of his cancer, so he had to take out an additional loan in addition to his medical school tuition loans to pay for his cancer treatment. Uh, that is, you know, then he had residency and not able to pay that back for a while too, in addition to the loan. So, um, you know, that, that's even, that's before the Affordable Care Act. So there are a lot of problems with just standard insurance coverage. Uh, you know, even with what you would assume would be very reasonable health insurance through a medical school, <laughs> uh, as a medical right. student. So, yep. uh, you know, there's no, there are no, there are no ex exceptions. Uh, uh, it's, it's been a broken system for a long time. Yeah. So on that note, that that Ben raises, what issue, what one issue in healthcare uh, do each of you most wish we could solve together? He mentioned a broken system. I think there's broad agreement on that. But whether it be an expert firsthand opinion from the doctors in the group, or or just something we see as patients and taxpayers, what's the one issue that we wish we could solve? I'm really pushing for the politics of a state like state where I'm in is California to uh, go single payer. That would be a huge step in uh, making things uh, affordable. And to drill I, down a little bit, Stephen, what what about single payer? What what issue are you most focused on in that prescription? Uh, well, just, you know, contacting contacting local politicians and uh, uh, working on it, uh, you know, to see, see what's, see if it's at all possible, you know, it's a huge, it's, it's like, it feels like a fantasy in a sense, because there's so many forces against it. I mean, as you said, Ben, with the lobbying, you know, uh, it, it's really challenging, but uh, uh, it's, a, we, we've agreed that this, pretty much a broken system. So we need to, it needs to be fixed. And I think that's the best fix. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's true. The rest of the world's in a system like that. Um, I think for anywhere in the United States to get a system, a single payer system, it's going to require a huge culture shift um, in the way that Americans think. Uh, and, and I have physician friends in Canada. And, you know, the, if, if you're told, um, you know, sorry, Mrs. Smith, uh, Seems like you might you might have a serious heart condition and you need a heart catheterization. Uh, we'll be able to get you on the schedule in in six months for that. And you know, that's just not going to be ex acceptable, I think, to the majority of Americans. Um, that's become kind of the status quo in a lot of places that have universal health health care and single payer systems, and that's just accepted the way it is. I, I think the pushback on that from um, our population would be tremendous. Um, so I, I think that'd be the major hurdle. For, for, for moving that direction. Well, there, there'd still be an economic uh, hierarchy with, with single payer. I mean, people can, there's a base level allowed for everybody, uh, which involves preventative steps. So hopefully there would be, you know, fewer catastrophes as where you need major treatment. But uh, uh, to allow, uh, you know, you, people can, People who they can afford it can pay for additional, can buy it. There'll still be insurance or for more benefits. So you don't have, in Canada, people can get in a policy to, that'll put them, bump them up the list, so to speak, and, or get it done privately. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that what we, what we call single payer or Medi Medicare for all, I mean, there's not just one version of that. You know, there's not just one version of that in Europe or Canada. Um, mm -hmm. It can look a lot of different ways, and 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 I know it's it's you know uh, these are very complex systems, um, but and it would be an adjustment. But you know, I I I feel like I would gladly trade like 
you know, because I, I already have to wait like six months to see some of the doctors that I need to see, like, I feel like I could live with that if I didn't, you know, have to, in the meantime, spend, because for me, with my current health issues, it's like a full-time job for me submitting um, because most of the practitioners that I see are not in network. So I end up having to submit claims for reimbursement and I end up having to submit them many times over because they are conveniently lost by the insurance, my, my insurance company, quote unquote, lost, not received, not processed. Um, and the amount of stress that that causes me having to deal with my insurance company having to submit and resubmit these claims, like, you know, I would gladly trade that for longer waiting times. Um, I do think that, I mean, I agree that it would be a huge uh, cultural shift for us, but, but um, I, I think that um, the benefits would be felt, you know, maybe quicker than, than one. Yeah, I have to agree. With you. I mean, I agree with you, Laura. To get to your question, Pierce, from my standpoint, I think that I think this is kind of a, a theme <laughs> that the the payer system is what had, it would have to be addressed first. I think, and that's what's been that's what the attempt has been. Um, it's what Laura's example is exactly right. I mean, yesterday I uh, I ever heard a conversation with the person who handles our insurance claims that she had submitted the same claim for a patient eight times to the yep. insurer, and, and they keep they they lose it. Um, we don't process it and that's just not acceptable. Uh, certainly it's never acceptable, but certainly not now when we expect things to be done, uh, instantaneously and we should have those expectations. We, we have that, we have those capabilities. It should be able to be done. Um, so that, that at some point we have to hold the insurance companies accountable, uh, and <laughs> they're going to have to, they're going to have to improve their performance. Um, so I, I, th I think that's, that's probably if you had if I had to pick one thing, uh, I think again, like I said, I think it kind of comes down to those two main categories. But certainly at the top of uh, the industry, government, insurance category, the insurance companies would be the, the first one to, right. to work on. In my opinion. Right. Thanks for that framing. Doctor. That's really helpful. I want to invite the many people who are watching us on Facebook to comment, ask questions. We'll throw them out to the group, um, but appreciate everybody who's enjoying this conversation. Go ahead and throw out some questions yourselves. John and Trey hadn't heard from y'all in a while. Um, any Anything you want to share um, or take us in a different direction? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the sort of in terms of where the levers are to try to improve things, I mentioned the payment systems. I mean, again, I hear sort of the frustration over both from the patient side and doctor. Um, the one area back to sort of what I was talking about before that I think would be an important lever that could improve things is reforming medical education and really um, focusing on giving, um, again, providers skills, entrepreneurial skills, management skills, leadership skills, understanding policy issues as they're going into the system to prepare them to actually be able to make positive change and navigate through this extraordinarily complex system. That would be one lever that I think we might look at reforming is saying what mm -hmm. maybe focusing a little bit less on sort of uh, the, the details of the uh, Krebs cycle, maybe a little bit more on sort of how are we going to sort of empower you to, to make positive change in the system. You mean, you mean you still don't know all the all the, cycle, uh, the parts of the Krebs cycle? <laughs> I, you know, what? I, I I was going, I was reviewing them last night. And it, it, it was amazing I, I that, how I little I remember. Right before surgery, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there might be a quiz. I thought there might be a quiz today. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's a great point. Um, and that's you know, Pierce can probably attest. That's the number one question I've gotten asked in the first six months in in business school is why are you here? You're a doctor. That's already your profession. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's it's because it's uh, for it's it's essential now. Um, it's it's the biggest uh, whole gap in our education. You know, you spend 10, 10 to twelve years in, in med school and residency, uh, and and you, you get about an hour of business training. That's that's not gonna that's not gonna cut it. Certainly not going mm -hmm. forward for the next twenty to thirty years of our careers. So um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that too. Yeah. I agree with that as well.
Uh, I think that uh, we definitely could get more education on that. Um, Pierce, um, in regards to your question on um, the one thing, it's actually something that uh, Ben touched on earlier. Um, and again, my perspective, not being in business school, being in the um, clinical setting each day, um, I mean, I really think that the, um, the interaction between the uh, health um, record systems is a huge issue. Um, mm. I think that, um, that the amount of waste, both from the time standpoint, the, um, the time spent obtaining records, um, and then also the, um, the, the actual procedures that have to be, um, or labs that have to be repeated, um, which are not all benign um, procedures. I mean, the, each and every day, there's patients that come to us that whether it's imaging that we need to um, obtain, or I mean, if, even if it's repeated visits, delays in care, these are all things that ultimately um, affect the, um, the cost of healthcare. And, um, and so it's, it's, I mean, there has been steps in, uh, towards having a, um, a, a computerized medical record system, but they don't interact with each other. So the problem is that it's, it's great if it's on a computer, but if that computer is not accessible to a provider, then there's, there's no way to, um, to have that interaction from one hospital to another hospital. And of course, I mean, there's issues with that. You can't just flip a switch and have it all interconnected because then you got to think about things like patient privacy and, and other issues that uh, definitely have to be resolved um, prior to just having a, a one system. It sounds easy to have one system where everybody can access, but there are definitely issues with that. Um, it's just more from the standpoint of, um, of having, I mean, we're still um, on a daily basis having to, um, if some patients had an imaging done, call in and having a fax sent of like the printout of the records. I mean, that and I, it, it almost defeats the, the purpose of having a, a computerized medical record system when literally what we're doing is we're accessing the computer uh, system to then print out something, take the printout, fax it to another provider who, who takes that, prints it out. I mean, it's just, some of it's just almost laughable how the, the interaction is just not there. Mm. So, Pierce, can you believe that? We actually have a fax machine that we use every day. <laughs> That's incredible. I barely know what the fax machine is. <laughs> uh, Mary Gaylord, one of our viewers on Facebook said, sounds like insurance companies hold inordinate power. How do we begin to shift that? What would you all say to Mary? Hmm. Well, again, the the lobbying that the insurance companies do essentially protect them from a great deal of accountability. The bills that you have said that don't get, don't, that they get, they lose uh, invoices, they lose things. That, that's crazy, you know, and that's just, and this happens because they're not being accountable. And they're not, there isn't anything in the law that says they have to be accountable, really. And uh, the, uh, hopefully that can change. You know, why should they? They're only getting away with that, so to speak, because there's the, 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 uh, the, the, lots. They pay off a lot of, you know, they contribute a lot to politicians, and they get protected. John, you pointed out earlier that providers can be kind of the forgotten uh, parties and stakeholders in this whole debate uh, from where you all sit, seeing the insurance companies holding um, a lot of power, regardless of your view. They are they are a big player in uh, in this whole system. What do you think uh, when it comes to the insurance companies? I mean, I would if, if I were to look at the payers and again, along the themes that I've been talking about, because I mean, there is so much complexity, I would say that you could make adjustments within whether it's government payment systems or insurance payment systems that are supportive of the by um, and should be from a policy perspective and a financial reward system that are and there was some that built into the affordable care act. I think that that was part of the idea was to sort of say, hey, in this system where you have all of these constituencies pulling in their own direction, they. Any you can imagine 30 different systems that are better than our system, but it's not just a matter of imagining it, it's actually moving from the complexity we are with all these different constituencies and taking sort of the disruptive versus policy, payment systems, technology, and sort of to a better system with, with priorities that more closely align with patients' 
sort of desires along in along the line of what providers really because I mean I think that sometimes we go into this everybody thinking oh gosh we're all selfish and to a degree we all are all selfish but I think in your heart of hearts most people also do want to do the right thing so trying to guide it towards that that better future and what what are the mechanisms within the system that that actually allow you to to, to guide it in a in a more sort of constructive in a constructive way. Yeah, thank you. Trey, from where you sit as a provider, what's your view of the insurance companies and how that might shift if it needs to shift to improve the system? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with what's been said so far. It's definitely an issue. Um, it's not going to be a quick fix. And I mean, the, the biggest problem I see on a daily basis is, um, is so, and this is, uh, is going back to uh, one thing um, that Laura said earlier, I'm asking about are we, um, are we influenced by insurance companies on a daily basis? So, um, for the most part, from every standpoint, we want to provide the best care, and that's the most important thing to us um, as physicians. Uh, where like the, the patient is what you know, we care about. The way the insurance affects that is that we know that patients have to be able to afford what we recommend. They also have to be able to, um, to if they if we need, if we recommend a certain um, tests like whether we want an MRI. Um, there's certain things that you have to meet in the check boxes to get that MRI um, able to be authorized by insurance. Um, so, um, from the standpoint of um, the vast, vast, vast majority of providers care most about doing the best thing for the patient, but we have to play the system that the insurance companies currently set up for us. So that's that's the biggest issue from a clinical standpoint. So I haven't heard anybody um, as a strident defender of the status quo. Um, so if, if we all <laughs> believe that something needs to change, um, you know, Stephen is putting forward an idea of kind of upending the whole system. Um, there are you know, other folks that want somewhat of a more marginal um, change. It, can we get there marginally, whatever there is for you, or do we need to brace ourselves to Ben's point? Does the population even, you know, understand the implications of, of some of these um, proposals. Can we do it um, piecemeal or do we need to fundamentally um, relook at and redesign the American healthcare system? So, I mean, I, I think people like Ben going to business school uh, to, uh, to really figure this out are as a great step in that direction. But I mean, honestly, to me, they would, it's on the surface, it sounds like, yeah, it'd be great to have a system where it, it would wasn't this there wasn't this waste but given where we are right now i don't see a way to just overhaul it because the one the cost associated with that um just like the seeing everything that would be involved with that on a daily basis just seems like that would be uh, prohibitive to try and overhaul and plus i mean there are a lot of good things that are in place right now too and um and so all the care that being, is being provided there would be a huge disruption in that so um, I mean, I think to me, I, if there was a way to change it to a better system, that's great, but I don't see a way to do that, like, like snapping your fingers and have that happen. So because yeah. of that, I think it has to be kind of a um, stepwise approach, having an analysis to figure out um, what's the um, best way to limit costs right now. Is it to take it from the um, insurance perspective? Is it to take it from the limiting the waste um, in, the, in the system perspective? Um, and kind of and reduce that and, and work our way towards the best system. But I mean, of course, that's the million dollar question right now is what is the best system? There's so many right. different opinions on that. Um, and, right. uh, and so it's not it's not like when I'm going to clinic every day, I see, oh, it's really obvious that there's this one system that's going to work. Why don't we do that? Right, right. And we're talking about, you know, between a fifth and a sixth of the American economy. So this is a huge behemoth that, that we're talking about improving. And, and that's not necessarily going to happen very easily. Um, Laura, any thoughts from your perspective? I mean, all I can say is I, I, I know there's no easy fix. I really hope that I see Medicare for all in my own lifetime. Uh, but if I do see it, it will be too late for me not to have, you know, <laughs> for my, my savings not to have been totally eroded <laughs> um, trying to save my own health. and. Um, so I, I just feel, I feel a sense of loss and I, I especially just felt so grief stricken, you know, over the past several months, just at the state of affairs in Washington, 
you know, with the, the debates around, you know, Trump care and, and the, you know, efforts to dismantle the, the Affordable Care Act, which nobody seemed to want except, you know, the politicians who were in the pockets of the insurance companies. And I don't know, I just, it just makes me so upset to be living in a country where people are like calling their Congress people, you know, begging for their lives. I mean, I just, I just feel sometimes like I can't, I can't live in a society that like where these are the values, like where, where this is even a, like where this is even a debate, like a conversation that, that people are being forced to have. Like it, it just makes me so upset. And, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm very like privileged. I have like, I at least have some resources to throw at my own health, but I know that I'm, you know, just so many people are so vulnerable and it just doesn't seem like, you know, anybody in Washington cares. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing that emotion. It's easy to talk about this issue from kind of an academic perspective, but these are lives, these are emotions, these are needs that I know the providers see and, and, and grapple with and hold every day. Um, but thank you for sharing that and being so vulnerable. Devlin Molyneux asked us, should profit be a consideration in looking at our overall healthcare system? Uh, we mentioned profit a little earlier. Um, should that be a consideration? How does it play in and should it at all? It doesn't, using it for, using medicine as a way of, or healthcare as a way of making profit simply has not worked to serve all of the people. It just doesn't work. There isn't enough to go around. The, the providers struggle with getting enough money out of it themselves to, to survive on. And certainly the patients suffer. Uh, the only victory is the insurance companies. They provide the, a little bit of the bookkeeping and a lot of hassle every provider I know, and I know a number of them, you know, the biggest complaint is dealing with the office and all the different insurance companies they have to deal with and all the different paperwork. It gets everybody crazy. And you got to have a, someone trained in just doing that with or more or a few people with different insurance companies. So it just doesn't work. And we're trying to juggle whatnot and whatnot, but it's, it's it ain't going to work. So as I said, Debbie Lynn asked, you know, should profit be a consideration in looking at the system? I'll, I'll add to her question, Whit Miller saying, you know, how do you expect to pay for your universal system? So we're talking about the money now. Um, what role should profit play, if any, and this universal idea, how are we going to pay for it? What do you providers have to say, seeing this day in and day out? Well, uh, there, there's always going to be, uh, it, it's hard, it's hard to strip an industry of profit, um, completely. Uh, I, I understand that perspective. It's, but it's that, that's, that's kind of what's gotten to us to this point. It's, you know, 30 years ago, this was seen as, as a very profitable industry or, or a lot of a place from which to extract a lot of profit. Um, and that's what's gone on. Um, with a lot of different uh, industries, including insurance companies, but pharmaceutical companies, device companies, um, uh, and, and electronic medical record companies, too. Uh, I, I, the, the amount of revenue that's been generated by those companies trying to implement electronic records is astronomical. So um, where there's opportunity, there's always going to be somebody trying to, to extract profit. So... I, I, those, those two things are, are probably going to be inseparable, but I think it's, is, uh, you know, let, enabling the pendulum to swing back in the other direction a little bit, uh, in the favor of the patients, um, and, and, and the providers, frankly, but the patients, of course, most first and foremost, so that everyone can feel, not have that stress that, that Laura was, was describing that emotional response and the patient shouldn't feel like they're unable to, receive the, the health care that they need. 
um, from a, from a financial point of point of view specifically. So that that should never be the issue. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I just I, you know, obviously heavier taxation would be crucial to to implementing a, a universal health care, a, you know, a Medicare for all system. Um, you know, I think that. Um, You know, a lot of people might balk at higher taxes, but I there is a there is a sense in which, you know, you don't you don't feel like the taxes that are being taken out of your paycheck as much as you feel like your credit card bill at the end of the month when you've had to pay out of pocket for for health care and and you know they you know have the slimmest of hopes that you're gonna get reimbursed for any any of it. I mean it you know yeah, I mean, obviously, ta taxation would would be would be the the source of you know the the funding for universal health care, but you know, like we've we've also talked about, like there are also sort of hybrid hybrid systems that combine you know um, uh, you know taxation for for health care with with you know people people do have access to private supplemental insurance. People of means, you know, can, um, you know, get addi additional services. So, uh, you know, I, it seems to me that it, it it could look like that as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would really rather see my my healthcare costs come out of my paycheck before I, I get my like you know net deposit. Then um, yeah, then there's some psychology there, right? Yeah, that's the psychology of it. I mean, I'd just be more comfortable with that. And I'd, I'd also, you know, it, it would uh, presumably be, a, again, like a, like a fixed percentage of income, you know, uh, on some level, which also is, you know, more comforting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, Karan said people should be able to buy into Medicare or Medicaid where there are no insurance providers or maybe where there is only a single insurance provider and no competition. So any reaction to that point, but even more broadly, this idea of mobility and competition and the state lines, things that, that, that us who aren't providers might be able to wrap our heads around a little bit. Um, any thoughts there on, on the current system and ways that we might increase competition, mobility from job to job, all those things that, that as Laura has, has so passionately voiced, that we deal with um, as, as patients. Is the question whether whether competition between different insurers could could actually drive down prices? Is this is that what's being proposed? The, I, I broadened it to that. Yes. What was said was people should be able to buy into Medicare or Medicaid where there are no insurance providers, or maybe where there is only a single insurance provider and no competition. That's a, a prescription, if you will, that Karan Kadlea has put forward. Um, but you know, curious any thoughts on that, but the broader issues as well. Well, this Medicaid be a public option, right? I mean, that's part of what we're talking about. Yeah. Like having a public option in addition to private insurance. Yeah. A public option would be like extending Medicare, which sure. only costs about 3% of the amount of money for, for the bookkeeping, so to speak, that goes on with it, all the expenses. Whereas all the expenses with, you know, if, if you pay $100 into an insurance company, maybe $70 will go for the service as opposed to $93. And, and that just is going to, you know, if every greed is, is a big factor. And if, if we, we do rely on safety features, like, like I said before, police and firemen uh, who, who don't, who the, the CEOs of the police department don't make such a huge amount of money because it's it doesn't work that way it's a service and the pride is in giving the service and we've really lost that value when it comes to uh not the providers but i think the providers do an incredible job with providing for the patients and and patients come first that's dynamite but providers are in tremendous amount of uh pressure with with uh, how to get paid and it's it's really challenging. 
I mean, th there are providers who, who now who, who just cater to very high end insurance where rich, very rich people just pay very lots of premium and they get the service any second they want it from a physician or any physician. That's a very different thing. It's really important that we deal that the government uh, changes some of these things uh, because the insurance companies are, are for the general public who are low income, particularly uh, with this most, a lot of Americans are working class Americans with relatively low income and they're struggling and they're dying young. Hmm. It's Devlin Molyneux has been with us the whole time and asked earlier about the role profit plays said, you know, she hears despair or resignation that profit will continue to be a part of our healthcare picture. Debelin's wondering about the public utility model, where private companies have the profit cap to provide a public service. Overall, she thinks taxation for healthcare would lower overall cost, and she'd love to see the studies of this. She says that we'd see decreased cost when we no longer pay premiums or deductibles, and local government would be freed up, um, would, would, would free up what is paid for indigent care. Any thoughts for Debelin on that? I agree with it. Oh, nuts. Anybody disagree? You know, I think that's one of the many possible solutions. Uh, those, are, those are the kinds of things that we do need to study and model and, and try to figure out if they're a feasible solution. I mean, what I will say is that I, I did, I did, I was under the impression that that is part of what the affordable uh, uh, Care Act did do was that it, it placed a cap on the amount of, of profit um, that insurance companies could sort of glean from from premiums and 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 so forth. Um, yeah, but it could be that I misunderstand that. I no, mean, no, I, think, I think you're right, but there, there when insurance companies are offsetting that is if there be any any percentage profit. Like, a, you know, why can't 100% or 97% of, of what gets paid into the pot, you know, uh, go into providing care? I mean, I just, I don't know why there has to be a cap in the first place. Like, why should it be uh, a space for, for, for gleaning profits, you know, but... I don't know why either. <laughs> I got Sabrina Moyle, who co-produces these conversations with me, said she's curious about Ben's earlier observation that some believe that Obamacare provides, quote, Lexus coverage when it's not needed. I um, would love to hear everyone's thoughts on which benefits are essential and which should be optional. So what Sabrina is referring to is this idea of essential health benefits. And we may have heard you know, that term thrown around in this debate. And these are the 10 categories of benefits that individual and small group plans must cover under the Affordable Care Act. So to Sabrina's question, you know, what are y'all's thoughts on essential health benefits, Ben, to your earlier point on Alexis when I might not need Alexis? Um, talk about that. that. That I think is the million dollar question because I think most people, not everybody, but people would say that to some degree, basic health care is a right people but the question that begs the question what is basic health care and that's where the debate comes in because you can sort of do it in the abstract at a policy perspective but let's say somebody does have a lymphoma or somebody does need sort of very costly cancer treatment or does need very costly surgery you get down this sort of ethical difficulty of all right is this person less allowed to access this care as somebody who has more resources or more money and that's that's the ethical that's the ethical dilemma that's sort of intrinsic in all of this. Either you provide everything for everybody or you provide some basic level and then you have to debate what that basic level is, which in, intrinsic in providing that basic level prevents people from getting things that could be beneficial to them and some people would say are absolutely needed. I and mean, that's the kind of question I think a lot of this. Yeah, and we only have a few minutes left, but to John's point, does anybody want to put a stake on the ground on what 
essential health benefits you see as essential? What should that minimum be? What should be optional? What becomes the Lexus and the Cadillac? Um, anybody have a better idea than, than the way the current system works under the Affordable Care Act? I guess I'm just, I'm not sure that, 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 um, that that metaphor of, of, you know, everybody gets a Lexus when some people may just need a, you know, whatever, <laughs> um, a Honda Fit. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, I just wonder if, 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 if it's slightly specious logic there, just because, you know, my understanding is that part of why, you know, everybody has to, you know, uh, you know, have coverage that that you know covers what are considered to be these essential health benefits. I mean, and I do I do think that there's probably room for sort of debate as to what counts as an essential health benefit, but but the insurance companies would not go for. Um, anything less than that, just simply because if you, if you let healthy people who don't access very much health care, you know, pay less in premiums for, for fewer benefits, then um, it, it becomes very difficult. You're basically trying to get healthy people to, to, to pay into the pot, right? Um, and, and if everybody's not paying a certain minimum, it becomes impossible to, to cover people who have, um, you know, Greater, greater needs in, in the realm of healthcare, and and, and who, um, whose healthcare costs are, are that much higher. So, um, yeah, Laura, you're getting into the basic, you know, economics, right? This idea of a doom loop. Um, it, it's pooling risk, and if all of us who are healthy say, you know what, I'm good, I don't need healthcare, um, right. and only the six people are paying in, that just doesn't work. Um, from a very kind of basic behavioral economic model. And that's where you get into to Mitt Romney and you know, the individual mandate and, and all of that. Um, so there are some, some very basic economics that, that are important to understand about the system. Ben, as you said, you, know, you were you know, referencing and citing your mentor who read all 2,700 pages of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so what, what do you have to say as you brought this kind of Lexus idea to the table? Yeah. Um... And it, it probably requires a much longer conversation, but I think that the, the way to boil it down is, is it's not it's not about denying anyone of basic uh, rights and basic health care. I, I think that it's it's just another it's just another part of kind of human psychology that if you have access to everything, if you have access to a buffet, you're always going to probably going to fill your plate more than, than you normally would. And so, but um, I do love Golden Corral. That's right. Um, so I, I think I mean that's not I mean not to trivialize the the conversation but it, but that's kind of the, the concept I think that he was getting at with that analogy is that um, you know everyone should have should have access to basic health care but if but but there's got to be some line drawn at some point um, you know to the points that were made earlier that, that we that it's just not sustainable if, if everyone has has access to everything you know so or if everyone feels like there's a it feels like they need to utilize the full extent of everything just because it's there. You can go to the emergency room because it's free, which might deprive someone who really needs emergency services from, from getting in. Um, but you go there because it's, it's open and available and, it's, and there's no cost. Uh, there's nothing cost prohibitive to it from your standpoint. So it's, it's about that, the human psychology part of it too, unfortunately. I mean, it's just, it's just that's part of the complexity. Yeah. If, if basic care was available, no one would need to go to an emergency room for something they could just go to their primary care doctor for. Uh, yeah, use of emergency room is, is out of whack because there isn't other health care available. It's, it's a last resort. And people don't get primary, people don't get primary care preventative stuff like you were saying, Ben, earlier. The, the prevention stuff isn't done so pe because there isn't uh, they're embarrassed. They can't. They don't have a doctor to go to, and things get worse. So they go to emergency room. That's that, that's where that happens. There's so many little issues that with just basic care would prevent not all the glorious extra things for a, a palatial whatnot, but it it could be really easily done with basic care. Yeah, I mean, I'm, not, 
I don't know what all 10 of the, I know what some of the 10, you know, essential benefits are. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm curious then, uh, are you aware of any, any benefits on, on that list that you think could be shaved off that, that, that you don't consider to be essential or? No, I, I agree. I, I, I'll, I'll revisited that again uh, earlier today, the 10 essential. And I think they all to some degree uh, need, need to be provided. Um, it's just the, the level to which they're provided is, is where if things need to be kind of teased, teased out a little bit. Uh, but I mean, they're all, I agree, they're all essential and they all need to be a basic, a basic you need to have basic access to all 10. I mean, it sounds like part of what you're saying is that people need to, um, you know, need to have some skin in the game, um, you know, in order to, like, you know, we, we can't trust people to, to exercise kind of personal responsibility unless they have some skin in the game. And it seems to me that there's there's got to be ways to to build that into a, a system that still affords everybody access to care I have to. and i'm not a policy wonk so i don't i don't know, know quite how to make that happen but it just seems to me that it it shouldn't be impossible <laughs> i think yeah. that's a great a great way to summarize it or i think that that captures the, the essence mm -hmm. of what i was trying to say with that with that analogy yeah, last comment from our audience before we close. Margot Mandela has what I think you know, may be a creative solution. Um, can essentials be based on age and medical cohort? For example, if you're childbearing age, then reproductive medical services would be considered essential in your cohort. Can the population be stratified that way to determine essentials versus you know painting with one broad brush as if we're all a monolith? Any thoughts on that and uh, and to the point of not being a policy wonk Laura I don't know if there is any stratification right now so maybe y'all can enlighten us on that you know, as well I kind of think that there is um, I, I, I think that there is because I think that's the one factor so insurance companies aren't allowed to factor in gender for instance so if you're a, a woman of childbearing age they can't charge you more um, but well if you're a woman I should say but yeah. I do I think that um, premiums are um, that that age is a factor in, in, in what premiums cost for, for people in different um, different age groups. I'm pretty sure, like for instance, um, that a you know a, a 60 year old woman who's not yet eligible for Medi Medicare would pay um, much more for an individual plan on the the insurance exchange. Like you know, like the state exchange in California, than than I would. Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult to draw a line too, Pierce, because anytime you're trying to say this is essential, this is not essential, I mean, it'd be really simple to say, okay, your mother, your son has this condition, and uh, it's not in this essential. Do you think we should expand the essential things? And all of a sudden, when it's that personal connection, you right. say yeah, this is essential. So it's very hard to define that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And one, one more point I wanted to make, Pierce, to tie a couple of the concepts together was, yeah. um, was that um, both from the preventative standpoint and also from the uh, economic standpoint, um, I think that one thing and also from the perspective of being a, um, going through medical school and making a decision about what, um, what residency and what uh, path I wanted to go through, um, um, just so the primary care, and I'm not in primary care, but the primary care compensation I think could uh, could be um, addressed to help incentivize more providers to go into primary care um, because the um, the specialties specialty services tend to make more money. And I think um, I think there has to be a balance there for sure, but I think that they're on the under end of that spectrum. And so to have more mm -hmm. primary care providers, I think right have, um, better. Um, uh, I think if you had better incentive for people to go into primary care, then mm -hmm. you start getting people that. Um, um, are and I mean it's one of the things that every everybody wants to help the patients uh, for sure and that's why we go to, that's why we all go to medical school um, and when you're deciding about what special you want to go into and whether it's medical school debt I mean um, from a global perspective not an individual perspective from a world perspective um, reimbursing um, primary care providers more would definitely swing that um, spectrum. Hmm. Yeah, and just and just going into medicine in general. That's one of my biggest fears and concerns is that people are going to be deterred from going into medicine in general 
because of the, the current state of affairs. It's, that's changed dramatically since I made that decision 15 years ago or whatever, however long it was. But it, it, uh, it's, that's a concern, I think, for our generation is, is going to be taking care of us in 20, 30 years. Maybe Watson you know, will come through. There you go. Figure it out. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. There, uh, there still needs to be a human provider to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. The artificial intelligence, which Ben and I are talking about in, in business school, that can change a lot of facets of our life, including healthcare. That could make for a whole nother conversation. Um, but I want to respect everybody's time. The last question I'll put forward to you in one sentence, share what was most meaningful or valuable to you in this Listen First conversation experience. For me, it's hearing everybody's perspectives. Um, for, you know, we hear the perspectives of other providers all all the time, but I, I enjoy hearing perspectives of of people who aren't in the medical field and who are experiencing it from the, the patient uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate hearing things from different different perspectives, and really, you know, uh, I take. I take a view, but there's there definitely challenges to it. And hearing hearing more specifically some of those challenges and opinions, uh, you know, certainly helps to broaden my perspective and uh, that's, adds to wisdom. Great, thank you, Stephen. Yeah. I I I guess I'm. I'm not uh, totally surprised to, to realize that there's a lot of um, common ground here um, and, and um, shared, you know, the shared values. I, I think it's really, evident. there's a lot of, you know, largely shared values here across political lines. Um, I just, uh, I mean, one of the, um, one of the, the viewers online was saying that 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 she she kind of felt there was a note of despair here, and I I um you know I'm I guess that it's participating in this has left me wondering like why given why given that there does seem to be so much common ground on this issue why is there also so much despair around it um, and what is it going to take for us to move forward on this issue as a as a country. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Watson. Trey, what was the experience like for you? I mean, I would say, um, probably in one sense, I would say that very similar, whether it's the providers or whether it's the uh, patients or whether it's um, people dealing with insurance, um, I think we all have the goal of wanting to, um, to get the best care to the patients. And mm -hmm. I think that um, we, really have to try and figure out a unified solution um, to, to satisfy the, um, the economic boundary we have um, and, and work with the, um, within the constraints that we currently have to try and adapt that so we can be more um, sustainable for the future to provide the best care. Yeah, thank you. This has been an awesome experience. And I think we can all recognize that rich civil dialogue like we've enjoyed here is not possible in sound bites. I mean, we've talked for an hour and a half and feels like we barely scratched the surface, but with sound bites and talking points from behind the keyboard, um, we're not going to fix this problem. It happens in conversation and in, in real genuine conversation between human beings of grace, humility, and goodwill, which each of you obviously are. As we demonstrated here, we all have a story to tell and a lot to learn from one another. We see that remaining in our echo chambers with people who look just like us and think like us is not only going to be boring, um, but also limiting to our development as individuals and as a society and how we understand the different walks that, that folks have. If we hope for a healthy and prosperous nation, we simply can't continue to vilify our fellow Americans because they see the world differently. So let's fix it. Let's start fixing it just like we did tonight. You know, join the Listen First movement. Please visit listenfirstproject.org to sign the Listen First Pledge. That's that I fully listen to and consider your views before sharing my own. I'll prioritize respect and understanding in conversation, and I'll encourage others to do the same. We saw such incredible examples of that in the conversation here tonight. You can also financially support the Listen First movement at listenfirstproject.org. Right now, we're raising money for a major event in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
to go up there and reverse the tragic story of racism, violence, and incivility that befell that city. Together, I would encourage us to rise above the vitriol and listen first. We will restore civil discourse, one listen first pledge and listen first conversation at a time. So all of you 6,000 that watched us here, why don't each of you uh, go and try to have one of these listen first conversations with a friend or a colleague in the next couple of days. Do what these folks did, um, dive into it, share your personal experience and gain a better understanding. It's not about compromise, it's not about coming to agreement, but you'll at least have a newfound respect and understanding for the other side, be able to move beyond slander and seek common ground. And please you know, hit us up, let us know how it goes. Thank you so much to each of you all for participating and to the 6,000, 6,700 now of you who joined us live. Uh, on behalf of Listen First Project and Living Room Conversations, I'm Pierce Godwin. Thank you all so much and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.